Hello, and welcome to the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, Chapter 9, Patient Assessment Lecture. After you complete this lesson and the related coursework, you will understand the scope and sequence of patient assessment for medical and trauma patients and all the phases and components of patient assessment. Please note that this chapter is divided into five sections, the size up, primary assessment, history taking, secondary assessment, and reassessment. These divisions will help facilitate the instructor's approach for teaching the skill as a whole concept. Within this chapter, we're going to talk about the scene size up and uh, the scene safety, management of the scene, and the impacts of the environment on patient care. We're gonna talk about addressing life hazards and violence also scene management and the need for additional or specialized resources, standard precautions, and also multiple patient situations. Then we're gonna talk about the patient assessment, uh, including the primary assessment for all patient, patient situations, the level of consciousness, the ABCs. We're gonna identify life threats, assessments of vital functions, and initial general impressions. We're going to begin interventions needed to preserve life in the primary assessment and the in integration of treatment procedures needed to preserve that life. The next part of the patient assessment is going to be history taking. Within the history taking, we're going to talk about determining the chief complaints, mechanisms of injury and illness, and associated signs and symptoms. We're also going to investigate um, the chief complaint, past medical history, and pertinent negatives. After history taking comes the secondary assessment. And this is, uh, we're gonna perform a rapid full body scan. We're gonna focus on uh, assessing pain, assessment of vital signs, techniques of physical exam. Um, we're gonna talk about the respiratory system. Within the respiratory system, the presence of the breast sounds. And, uh, also techniques of physical exam for the cardiovascular system, the neurologic system, the muscular skeletal system, and then uh, additional uh, anatomic regions. And we're gonna talk about uh, monitoring devices, including and obtaining, using information from those monitoring devices, uh, such as the pulse ox and non-invasive blood pressure machine. And then we're gonna talk about the reassessment, how and when to reassess patients, and how to perform a reassessment for all patient situations. Okay, and as we begin. So an introduction, the importance of patient assessment cannot be overemphasized. EMTs must master and be comfortable with the patient assessment process. Patient assessment is used to some degree in every patient encounter. As I mentioned earlier, there are five main parts of the patient assessment. This includes the scene size up, the primary assessment, history taking, the secondary assessment, and the reassessment. The order in which these steps are performed depends on the patient's condition and the environment in which the patient is found. It may be necessary to change the order of some of these steps after scene sized up based on your findings and the need to prioritize the care of certain conditions. Rarely does a sign or symptom show you the patient's status or underlying problem. And just to um, explain a sign uh, is an objective condition you can observe or measure about your patient. A symptom is a subjective condition in which the patient feels and tells you about. The treatment EMTs provide patients is based on symptoms, not an exact diagnosis. The patient assessment process is the foundation upon which the EMTs education is built and is the starting point for all patient care. Okay, we're going to talk about the very first part of the patient assessment next, and that is the scene size up. The scene size up refers to your evaluation of the conditions in which you will be operating. Situational awareness is necessary throughout the entire call to ensure safety. 
situational awareness is paying attention to the conditions and people around you at times and the potential risks those conditions or people pose. Scene size up is the first thing to consider, but it does not end as providers move through the assessment process. Dispatch provides basic scene size up about the request for assistance. Size up combines informations and observations to help ensure safe and effective operations. Understanding of the situation and conditions prior to responding, also the dispatcher's information and the observation of the scene. Issues that you may encounter in the pre-hospital setting can range from minor difficulties to major dangers. Even scenes that first appear relatively safe and secure can turn unsafe with little notice. If a scene is not safe for you and your team to enter the scene and approach and manage the patient, do what you can to make it safe or call for additional resources, such as firefighters, utility workers, hazardous materials technicians, or law enforcement personnel. Typically, the way you enter an area is also the way you will leave with a stretcher, a patient, a patient care equipment, and personal belongings. Consider difficult terrain. Consider traffic safety issues and issues related to scene safety if you must approach a patient on a working roadway, where at a minimum, a high visibility class two or three safety vest approved by the American National Standards Institute. Other traffic incident management techniques may be appropriate, such as traffic markers, including cones, flares, and sign, and strategic positioning of emergency vehicles. Consider environmental conditions at the scene. Your patient may be outdoors, indoors, or in a public place. Be aware of the weather and the physical terrain. Work in favorable, you will be working in unfavorable conditions and on unstable surfaces is a large part of pre-hospital care. A good rule to use when faced with a wide variety of possibilities is that any actions you may take to protect yourself should also be considered for the patient. If appropriate, help protect bystanders from becoming patients as well. Some forms of hazards include environmental, physical, such as sharp metal, broken glass, slip and fall hazards, chemicals, electrical, water, fire, explosives, physical violence. So be aware of scenes that have the potential for violence, including violent patients, distraught family members, angry bystanders, gangs, or unruly crowds. An emergency scene is a dynamically changing environment. It is up to you to either make the scene safe if you have the training and equipment to do so, or call for additional resources and move to a safe location. Determine the mechanism of injury, which is the MOI, or the nature of illness, which is the NOI. Virtually all calls for assistance to which you may respond can be categorized as medical conditions, traumatic injuries, or both. A medical problem can lead to a traumatic injury. You may need to be able to identify the general classification and underlying issues of an emergency to which you respond. Traumatic injuries are the result of physical forces applied to the outside of the body, usually from an object striking the body or the body striking an object. Classified according to the type and amount of force, how long the force was applied, and where it was applied to the body. This is described as the mechanism of injury, or MOI. Certain parts of the body are more easily injured than others. Fragile and easily injured areas include the brain, spinal cord, and eyes. An understanding of anatomy and physiology will help EMTs to identify times when the mechanism of injury may lead to injury of parts of the body not directly impacted. With blunt force trauma, the force of the injury occurs over a broad area 
the skin is sometimes not broken. However, the tissues and organs underneath the area of impact may be damaged. With penetrating traumas, the force of the injury occurs at a specific point of contact between the skin and the object. It is an open wound with a high potential for infection. For medical patients, determine the nature of illness, which is the NOI. There are similarities between the MOI and NOI. They both require you to search for clues regarding how the incident occurred. To determine, quickly determine the NOI, talk to the patient, family, or bystanders. Use your senses to check the scene for clues as to the physical problem. Be aware of scenes with multiple patients who are exhibiting similar signs and symptoms. This could indicate an unsafe scene for you or your partner as well. The importance of the MOI or NOI is to consider the M MOI and NOI early can be of value in preparing you to care for the patient. During your pre-hospital assessment, you may be tempted to categorize your patient immediately as trauma or medical. Remember the fundamentals of a good patient assessment are the same despite the unique aspects of trauma and medical care. Standard precautions and personal protective equipment, or PPE, need to be considered and adapted to pre-hospital task at hand. PPE includes clothing or specialized equipment that provides protection to the wearer. The type of PPE used will de depend on the specific job duties required during the patient care interaction. The concept of standard precautions assumes that all blood and body fluids except sweat, non-contact skin, and mucous membranes may pose a substantial risk of infection. This includes blood and other potentially infectious materials that are dried because some disease can live outside the body for days. When you step out of the EMS vehicle and before actual patient contact, standard precautions must have been taken or initiated. At a minimum, gloves must be in place before any patient contact. Also consider glasses and a mask. If the patient condition warrants a higher PPE, providers should regroup and upgrade the protection. Determine the number of patients. So during scene size up, it is important to accurately identify the total number of patients critical in determining your need for additional resources. When there are multiple patients, you should use the instant command system, identify the number of patients, and then begin triage. The instant command system is a flexible system implemented to manage a variety of emergency scenes. Triage is the process of sorting patients based on the severity of each patient's condition. Next, we're going to talk about considering additional specialized resources. In some situations, you may require more ambulances or specialized resources. Specialized resources include advanced life support or ALS, air medical support, also could include fire departments, which may handle hazardous materials management, technical resource, uh, rescue resources, also including extrication from a motor vehicle crash, wilderness search and rescue, high angle rope rescue, or water rescue. Also, some specialized additional resources include law enforcement personnel. They may be needed to assist with traffic or scene control and should be first to enter crime scenes and hostile environments. To determine if you require additional sources, resources, ask yourself, does the scene pose a threat to you, your patient, or others? And how many patients are there? Do we need to have resources to respond to other conditions? Okay, next thing we're going to talk about is the primary assessment. And patient assessment begins when you greet your patient. The initial all-important goal of the primary assessment is to identify and begin treatment of immediate and uh, 
imminent life threats. So you must physically examine the patient and access the level of consciousness. So the airway and then the airway breathing and circulation. You must form the general impression of the patient. And this includes the initial general impression is formed to determine the priority of care and is the first part of your primary assessment. It includes making a note of the person's age, sex, race, level of distress, and overall appearance. As you approach, make sure the patient sees you coming. Note the patient's position and whether the patient is moving or still. Avoid standing over the patient if possible. Address the patient by name. Introduce yourself to the patient. Ask about chief complaint. The patient's response can give you insight into their level of consciousness, their air patency, respiratory status, and overall circulatory status. Life-threatening problems should be treated immediately. Define whether your patient's condition is stable, stable is potentially, but potentially unstable, or unstable to direct further assessment and treatment. Assess the level of consciousness, or LOC. The LOC can tell you a great deal about the patient's neurologic and physiologic status. Determine which of the following categories best fits your patient. Is your patient unconscious, conscious with an altered LOC, conscious with an unaltered LOC? Assessment of an unconscious patient focuses on the airway, breathing, and circulations. Sustained unconsciousness should warn you that a critical respiratory, circulatory, or central nervous system problem or defect might exist. Conscious with an LOC may be due to inadequate perfusion. Perfusion is the circulation of blood within the organ or tissue, and it can also be caused by medications, drugs, alcohol, or poisoning. To assess for responsiveness, use the mnemonic AVPU and choose one description. The A in AVPU stands for awake and alert. Is the patient aware of you and is responsive to the environment? The responsive to the verbal stimuli is next. The patient is not alert and awake. The patient's eyes open to loud verbal stimuli and he or she is unable to respond in some meaningful way once spoken to. The P is responsive to pain. The patient does not respond to your questions, but moves or cries out in response to painful stimulus. And then the U, the U is unresponsive. The patient does not respond uh, spontaneously to a verbal or painful stimulus, has no cough or gag reflex. Stimulus tests determine whether a patient who does not respond to verbal stimuli will respond to painful stimuli. These tests include pinching the patient's skin, which is the back of the upper arm or the trapezius area, apply upward pressure along the ridge of the orbital rim along the inside of the eyebrow. A patient who moans or withdraws is responding to this stimulus. Okay, orientation tests mental status by checking a patient's memory or thinking ability. So person refers to his or her name, place, identifies the location, the current location, time, the current year, month, and approximate date, and event, uh, which describes what has happened. Next, we're going to talk about um, the accessing the level of consciousness, and we're going to evaluate long-term memory, um, intermediate memory, and short-term memory. If the patient knows these facts, the patient is said to be alert and fully oriented. Uh, alert and oriented person plays time and event, or alert and oriented times four. Any deviation from alert and oriented to person plays time and event, um, from a patient's normal baseline is considered altered mental status.
Okay, after we assess the level of consciousness, we're going to identify and treat life threats. And so these are described as a life-threatening condition which can quickly lead to death. Conditions that cause sudden death include airway obstructions, respiratory failure, respiratory arrest, shock, severe bleeding, or cardiac arrest. In most cases, identifying and correcting life-threatening issues begins with the airway followed by the breathing and circulation. When a patient is in cardiac arrest, the ABC should be assessed simultaneously to minimize the time of the first compression. When a patient has life-threatening bleeding, it is important to address life threats to circulation first following a sequence of circulation, airway, and then breathing, so CAP. Next, we're gonna assess the airway. As you move through your primary assessment, stay alert for signs of airway obstruction. To prevent death or permanent disability to your patient, you must ensure the airway remains open and adequate. Responsive patients. So patients of an age who are talking of any age, sorry, who are talking or crying have an open airway. Watching and listening to how patients speak may provide important clues about the adequacy of the airway and status of their breathing. If you identify an airway problem, stop the assessment process and work to clear the patient's airway. With unresponsive patients who, um, who have a decreased LOC, Immediately assess the patient's airway. If there is a potential for trauma, use the jaw thrust to open the airway. If you cannot obtain a patent airway using the jaw thrust maneuver, or if you can be, or if it can be confirmed that the patient did not experience any trauma, you can use the head tilt chin lift maneuver to open and maintain the um, airway. Another cause of an airway obstruction in an unconscious patient could be the relaxation of the tongue muscles, allowing the tongue to fall back um, to the back of the throat. Signs of obstruction of an unconscious patient include obvious trauma, blood, or some type of other obstruction, noisy breathing, such as snoring, bubbling, gurgling, crowing, strider, or any abnormal sounds, or extremely shallow or absent breathing. Okay, next we're gonna talk about assessing the breathing. So once you have made sure that the airway is open, uh, make sure that the patient's breathing is present and adequate. A patient who is breathing without assistance is said to be spontaneous, uh, to have spontaneous respirations or spontaneous breathing. You as you assess the patient's breathing, ask the following questions. Is the patient breathing? Is the patient breathing adequately? And is the patient hypoxic? Positive pressure ventilation should be performed for patients who are not breathing or whose breathing is too slow or too shallow. If the patient is breathing adequate but remains hypoxic, administer oxygen. The goal for oxygenation for most patients is an oxygen saturation of approximately 94 to 99%. If a patient seems to develop difficulty breathing after your primary assessment, you should immediately reevaluate the airway. Consider providing positive pressure ventilations with an airway adjunct when respirations exceed 28 breaths per minute, respirations are fewer than eight breaths per minute, or respirations are too shallow to provide adequate air exchange. Observe how much effort is required for the patient to breathe. So the presence of retractions or the use of accessory muscles, nasal flaring, two to third word dyspnea, a tripod position, sniffing position, or labored breathing. Respiratory distress occurs when a person, particularly a child, has difficulty breathing. It includes increased effort and rate. Respiratory failure occurs when the blood is inadequately oxygenated or ventilated 
uh, ventilation is inadequate to meet the oxygen demands of the body. Okay, next after A and B is C. And uh, we're going to assess the circulation. So we're going to assess it for um, the circulation is evaluated by assessing the patient's mental status, pulse, and skin condition. Assessing the pulse where is often referred to as the heartbeat. The pulse is the pressure wave that occurs as each heartbeat causes a surge in blood circulating through the arteries. To determine if a patient's uh, pulse is present, you need to palpate. Um, palpate means feel the pulse. In response of patients who are older than one year old, you should palpate the radial pulse at the wrist. In unresponsive patients who are older than one year, you should palpate the carotid pulse at the neck. Palpate the brachial pulse located in the medial area, which is inside, of the upper arm in children younger than one year. If you cannot uh, palpate the pulse in an unresponsive patient, begin CPR. If an AED is unavailable, turn it if an AED is available, turn it on and follow the voice prompts following your local protocol. If the patient has a pulse but is not breathing, provide ventilations at a rate of 10 to 12 breaths per minute for adults and 12 to 20 breaths a minute for infant and children. Monitor the patient's pulse. If the patient becomes pulseless, start CPR and apply the AED. Skin condition is next for the circulation. Perfusion is assessed by evaluating a patient's skin color, temperature, moisture, and cap refill. A normally functioning circulatory system perfuses the skin with oxygenated blood. Skin color. The skin color is determined by the blood circulating through the vessels and the amount and type of pigment that is present in the skin. Poor peripheral circulation will cause the skin to appear pale, white, ashen, or gray. When the blood is not properly saturated with oxygen, uh, it will appear blue. High blood pressure may cause the skin to be abnormally flushed or red. Changes in skin color may also result from chronic illness. Next is the skin temperature. Normal skin temperature will be warm to the touch. A normal body temperature is 98.6 or 37 degrees Celsius. Normal skin temperatures or abnormal skin temperatures are hot, cool, cold, and clammy. Skin moisture. So the skin, dry skin is normal. Skin that is wet, moist, or often called diaphoretic or excessively dry and hot suggests a problem. Cap refill is often evaluated in pediatric patients to assess the ability of the circulatory system to perfuse the capillary system in the fingers and toes. Cap refill time can be affected by the patient's age, history, medications, and the environment. To test the cap refill, place your thumb on the patient's fingernail with your fingers on the underside of the patient's finger and gently compress. Remove the pressure. As the underlying capillaries refill with blood, the nail bed returns to normal pink color. With inadequate perfusion, the color in the infant or child's nail bed should be restored to normal pink within two seconds. With adequate perfusion, the color in the infant's child's nail bed, um, like I said, will return within two seconds. And here is a demonstration slide. Assess and control external bleeding. In trauma patients, identify and control major external bleeding. This step should occur before addressing airway and breathing uh, concerns. Bleeding from a very large vein is characterized by a steady flow of blood. Bleeding from an artery is characterized by a spurting flow of blood. Run gloved hands from the patient's head to toe 
pausing periodically to see if your gloves are bloody. Controlling external bleeding is often very simple. Apply uh, direct pressure. If the direct pressure is not quickly successful or if there is an obvious arterial hemorrhage of an extremity, apply a tourniquet. Perform a rapid scan to identify life threats. Scan the patient's body to identify injuries that must be managed or protected before the patient is transported. Take 60 to 90 seconds to perform the rapid scan. This is not a systematic or focused physical exam. Today, we will perform, that will be performed during the secondary assessment, which is on skill drill 9-1. Determine priority of patient care and transport. The primary assessment assists to determine transport priority. High priority patients include those with any of the following conditions. So if your patient is unresponsive, if your patient has a poor general impression, or if your patient is having difficulty breathing, that's a high priority patient. Also, uncontrolled bleeding, responsive but unable to follow commands, severe chest pain, pale skin or other signs of poor perfusion, complicated childbirth or severe pain in any area of the body, um, or if a spinal injury is suspected or found on assessment, consider spinal immobilization. Okay, and so next we're going to talk about the um, priority of the patient relating to the golden hour. Uh, you might also hear it uh, called the golden period, and this is the time from the injury to the definitive care, during which treatment of shock and traumatic injuries should occur because survival potential is best. So, uh, we assess, we aim to assess, stabilize, package, and begin transport to the appropriate facility within 10 minutes um, on scene. So that's referred to as the Platinum 10 um, after you uh, arrive on scene. And so this slide, there's an illustration that presents the golden hour or golden period. Okay. Transport decisions should be made at this point. Um, and so some patients will benefit from immediate transport while others are better served on scene. So transport decisions are based on the patient's condition, the availability of advanced care, and uh, the distance of the transport, and also local protocols. Next, we're gonna talk about uh, history taking. So history taking provides detail about the patient's chief complaint and the account of the patient's uh, signs and symptoms. So be sure to document the following information. So the date of the incident, the patient's age, the gender, the race, the medical history, and the patient's current health status. You want to identify the chief complaint and um, the history of the present illness. So to investigate the chief complaint, uh, begin by making introductions and make the patient feel comfortable and obtain permission to treat. So ask uh, a few simple questions or direct questions. Refer the patient as Mr. or Mrs. using the patient's last name. Open-ended questions will help determine the chief complaint. Use eye contact to encourage the patient to continue speaking and repeat statements back to show understanding. If the patient is unresponsive, information about the patient's pertinent past medical history and clues about the immediate incident may be obtained from family members, a person who has witnessed the situation, perhaps bystanders, a medical alert jury, or other patient medical history documentation. Next, we're gonna use the mnemonic OPQRST for gathering additional information about the patient's present illness or current symptoms. We're gonna start with O. O stands for onset, and that's what they were doing when the symptoms began. Provocation or palpation, that's does anything make the symptoms better or worse? Quality, what does a symptom feels like? Region or radiation, where do you feel the symptom? Does it move anywhere? Severity, 
and this is on a scale of 0 to 10, how would you rate your symptom? And T is timing. Has the symptom been constant or does it come and go? Also identify pertinent negatives. So pertinent negatives are a negative findings that warrant no care or intervention. Pertinent negatives are often helpful in identifying a patient's problem or choosing an appropriate treatment. Okay, next we're going to use sample um, as the mnemonic to obtain uh, the patient's history. So uh, symptoms are complaints, once again, that cannot be felt or observed by others. And signs are objective conditions that uh, can be seen, heard, felt, smelled, or measured by you or others. We use the mnemonic sample uh, to obtain the following information. S is signs and symptoms. What signs and symptoms occurred at the onset of the incident? Allergies. Is the patient allergic to any medication, food, or substances? Medications. Is the M, um, what medications is the patient prescribed? P stands for past pertinent medical history. Does the patient have any history of medical surgery or trauma occurring? And L, last oral intake, did, uh, when did the patient last eat or drink? And E is events leading up to the illness or injury. And what key events uh, led up to this incident? Critical thinking in assessment. So critical thinking is an essential component in assessing a patient. It involves gathering, um, which is seeking facts to help your clinical decision making and uh, scene management. Also evaluating, so considering what the information gathered means and synthesizing, putting it all together um, to uh, everything that you have gathered and, um, and make a plan to manage the scene or care for the patient. History taking on sensitive topics is the next thing we're going to talk about. And so alcohol and drugs. So signs may be confusing, hidden or disguised. Um, many patients may deny having any problems. The history gathered from a chemically dependent patient may be unreliable. Do not judge the patient and be professional to in your approach. Also, uh, physical abuse or violence. So report all physical abuse or domestic violence to the appropriate authorities. Follow state laws and uh, local protocols. Do not accuse in Instead, immediately involve law enforcement. The next uh, sensitive topic we're going to discuss is sexual history. So consider all female patients of childbearing age who report lower abdominal pain to be pregnant unless ruled out by history or other information. Questions to ask when faced with this in a pre-hospital scenario include, when was your last menstrual period? Are your periods normal? If the patient is bleeding, how many sanitary pads or tampons have been used? Do you have urinary frequency or burning? What is the severity of the cramping? And are there any foul odors? Are you sexually active? Is there a possibility you can be pregnant? Are you taking birth control pills? Inquire about urinary symptoms with male patients. Is there pain associated with urination? Do you have any discharge, sores, or increase in urination? Did or do you have burning or difficulty voiding? Was there or has there been any trauma? And have you had recent sexual encounters? When appropriate, ask about the potential for sexually transmitted diseases in all patients. Special challenges in obtaining patient history include silence. So Patient is extremely important when dealing with patients and their emergency uh, crisis. So use a close-ended question that requires a simple yes or no answer may work best. And consider whether the silence is a clue to the patient's chief complaint. Also, overly talkative patients. So gathering details about a patient's medical condition may be difficult if he or she talks around your question or you have difficult uh, refocusing the patient's um, conversation. Reasons why a patient may be over talkative include uh, 
excessive caffeine, nervousness, ingestion of crack or cocaine or methamphetamines, or an underlying psychological issue. Also, multiple symptoms, often true of older patients, so prioritize the patient's complaints as you would in triage. Start with the most serious and end with the least serious. Another challenge would be anxiety. Consider the content of the situation. Recognize that, uh, that you observed anxiety may be a sign of a serious underlying medical condition. Frequently, anxious patients can be observed in emergency scenes that involved a large number of patients, such as during a disaster. Some um, anxious patients show signs of physiological shock, such as um, diaphoresis or shortness of breath, numbness in hands and the feet, dizziness or lightheadedness, or loss of consciousness. Anxiety can be an early indicator of low blood sugar, shock, and hypoxia. Okay, another special consideration could be anger or hostile patients. So every patient encounter has a high potential for verbal hostility and physical violence. Friends, family, or bystanders may direct their anger and rage towards you. Remain calm, reassure, and be gentle. If a scene is not safe or secured, retreat until it is secured. Also, a special consideration uh, and challenge is intoxication. Do not put an intoxicated patient in a position where he or she feels threatened and has no way out. The potential for violence in a physical confrontation is high uh, when a patient is intoxicated. Alcohol does, dulls a patient's senses, which may make it difficult for an intoxicated patient to inform you that, they're, um, that they feel pain. The next is crying. So a patient who cries may be sad in pain or emotionally overwhelmed. Remain calm and patient, reassure and confident, and uh, maintain a soft voice. Another special challenge in obtaining a patient history is depression. So depression is among the leading cause of disability worldwide. worldwide. Um, symptoms include sadness, feeling hopelessness, restlessness, irritable, sleeping and eating disorders, a decreased uh, energy level. The most effective treatment in handling a patient's depression is being a good listener. A ne the next a special challenge in uh, obtaining a patient history is confusing behavior or history. Conditions such as hypoxia, stroke, diabetes, trauma, medication use, and other drug use could alter the patient's explanation of events. Hypoxia is the most common cause of confusion. And in older patients, it is not uncommon to encounter a patient who has dementia, delirium, or Alzheimer's disease. Also, limited cognitive abilities. So keep your questions simple and use um, uh, limit the use of medical terms with these patients. Be alert for partial answers and keep, uh, keep asking the questions. So in cases of patients with a severely limited cognitive function, rely on family members, a caregiver, or friends to answer questions. The next challenge is going to be cultural. So do not use medical language with these patients uh, as well. Patients from some cultures may prefer to speak only with healthcare providers of the same gender. So gain the assistance of the patient's friends and family members and enlist the help of healthcare providers of the same culture or background if possible. Next special challenge could be language barriers. Um, and for these patients, you may need to find an interpreter. If you cannot, determine whether the patient understands who you are, keep questions straightforward and brief, and use hand gestures. Be aware of language diversity in your community. Next, um, 
special challenge would be a hearing problem, so ask questions slowly and clearly. You could use a stethoscope to function as a hearing aid for the patient. Learning simple sign language uh, during your career will help you in the communication process. Also, you could use a pen and paper. The next uh, special challenge would be a visual impairment. So identify yourself verbally while entering the scene. It is important for you to put any items that have been moved back into their previous position on, on a scene. And during the assessment and history taking process, explain each step in the vital signs assessment. Notify the patient before preparing to lift the patient and move him or her onto the stretcher. Okay, so secondary assessment. If the patient is in stable condition and has an isolated complaint, you may choose to perform the secondary assessment at the scene. If the secondary assessment is not performed at the scene, it is performed in the back of the ambulance and route to the hospital. However, there will be situations where you may not have to, uh, time to perform the secondary assessment. You may have to continue to manage life threats identified during the primary and route to the hospital. The purpose is to perform a systematic physical exam of the patient. And so the, the physical exam may be a systematic head to toe, secondary assessment, or an assessment that focuses on a certain area or system of the body, often determined through the chief complaint. Okay, so how and what to assess. And guidelines on how and what to assess um, during the physical exam include, so we're gonna do an inspection, and that you wanna look at the patient for abnormalities. Next, you're gonna do palpation, and that is a touch or feel for patient for abnormalities. And then the next is going to be auscultation, and you're gonna listen to sounds um, which the body makes through your stethoscope. The mnemonic DCAP BTLS reminds you what to look for when inspecting and palpating various body regions. Compare findings on one side of the body with the other side when possible. Systematically assess the patient, uh, the secondary assessment. So the goal is to identify hidden injuries or identify causes that may not have been identified during your 60 to 90 second exam during your primary assessment. So see your skill drill on 9-2. All right, so systematically assessing the patient, um, which is the focus assessment, performed on patients who have sustained a non-specific mechanism of injury or on responsive medical patients. So this type of examination is typically based on their chief complaint. The goal of a focus assessment is to focus your attention on a body part or system affected based on the priority problems. All right, and so the first one we're gonna talk about is the respiratory system. So what you wanna do for the respiratory system is you wanna expose the patient's chest you wanna look again for signs of an airway obstruction as well as trauma to the neck or chest. Inspect the chest for overall symmetry. Listen carefully to breath sounds, noting abnormalities. Measure the respiratory rate, chest rise and fall for tidal volume and effort. Look for retractions. Look for increased work of breathing and assess the patient's breathing by watching the patient's chest rise and fall. Uh, once again, listening to breath sounds with a stethoscope over each lung. If the patient is unconscious, you're feeling um, for air through the mouth and nose during inhalation. You want to um, uh, measure and obtain the respiratory rate. So a normal respiratory rate wi uh, varies widely in adults, but it ranges from 12 to 20. And children breathe at even faster rates. So Respirations are determined by counting the number of breaths in a 30 second period and by multiplying by two. The result equals the number of breaths per minute. You want to measure the rhythm. So you're gonna have, uh, uh, if the time from one peak chest rise 
to the next is fairly consistent. Respirations are considered regular. If the respirations vary in the rate changes or if the rate changes frequently, the respirations are considered irregular. Next, we're going to talk about the quality of breathing. So normal breathing is always silent. Uh, breathing accompanied by sounds may indicate a significant respiratory problem. The depth of breathing. The amount of air that the patient is exchanging depends on the rate and tidal volume. Tidal volume is measured, a uh, measurement of the depth of breathing and is the amount of air that is moved in and out of the lungs during one breath. Breath sounds, how and where to listen to assess breath sounds. Okay, so you can always, um, almost always hear a patient's breath sounds better from the patient's back. So auscultate over the upper lungs, um, the mid lungs, and the lower lungs. Lift the clothing and slide the stethoscope under the clothing. Place the diaphragm of the stethoscope firmly against the skin to hear the breath sounds. The photo on the slide demonstrates how to listen to the patient's breath sounds. Okay, what are we listening for? So normal breath sounds should be clear and relatively quiet during inspiration and expiration. Snoring breath sounds. This suggests an obstruction or narrowing of the lower airways. Wheezing breath sounds suggest an obstruction of the lower airways. Crackles is a crackle or wet breath sound, and it may indicate fluid in the lungs. Ronchi is a congested breath sound, which may indicate the presence of mucus in the lung. Strider is often heard before listening with a stethoscope and may indicate that the patient has an airway obstruction in the neck or upper part of the chest. So determine the quality or character of respirations while counting the number. Okay, and so if the um, cardiovascular system is involved, we're going to look for trauma. Once again, we're gonna consider the pulse and respiratory rate and the blood pressure. We're also gonna pay particular attention to the rate, quality, and rhythm. We're gonna consider findings when assessing the skin. We're gonna check the skin um, and compare distal pulses to determine any right or left-sided differences. Consider auscultation for abnormal heart sounds. And then we're going to uh, get the pulse rate. So for an adult, the normal resting uh, pulse rate should be between 60 and 100 beats and could be as much as 100 beats in older patients. In pediatric patients, determine the young, generally the younger the patient, the faster the pulse rate. To obtain the pulse rate in most patients, you should count the number of, of pulses felt in 30 seconds and then multiply times two. A rate that is greater than 100 is described as tachycardia. A rate of less than 60 is described as bradycardia. Pulse quality, if the pulse feels of normal strength, you should describe it as being strong. You should describe a stronger than normal pulse as bounding. A pulse that is weak or difficult to feel is described as weak or thready. All right, the pulse rhythm. So determine whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. The interval between each contraction should be the same, and the pulse should appear to be constant, regular rhythm. The rhythm is considered irregular if the heart period periodically has an early or late beat or if the pulse beat is missed. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do with the cardiovascular system involvement is the blood pressure. Blood pressure is the pressure of circulating blood against the walls of the artery. A decrease in blood pressure may indicate a loss of blood or fluid components, a loss of vascular tone, or sufficient arterial constriction, or a cardiac pumping problem. 
Decreased blood pressure is a late sign of shock and indicates that the critical stage of decompensated shock has begun. Abnormally high blood pressure may result in a rupture or a critical damage in the art arterial system. So systolic pressure is the, is the increased pressure that is caused along the artery with each contraction of the ventricles and the pulse wave that it produces. Diastolic pressure is the residual pressure that remains in the arteries during the relaxation phase of the heart's cycle and uh, when the left ventricle is at rest. A blood pressure cuff with a gauge contains the following components. A wide outer cuff, an inflatable wide bladder sewn into a portion of the cuff, a ball pump with a one-way valve, and a pressure gauge collaborated in millimeters of mercury. Auscultation is the most common means of measuring a patient's blood pressure. So see the skill drill on in your book in chapter 9, uh, skill drill 9-3. The palpation or feeling method does not depend on your ability to hear sounds and should be used in circum certain, certain circumstances to obtain blood pressure problems. Normal blood pressure. A patient has hypotension when the blood pressure is lower than the normal range and hypertension when the blood pressure is higher than the normal range. Okay, next we're going to talk about the neuro when there's neurological system involvement. So a neurological assessment should be performed anytime you're confronted with a patient who has an altered mental status, a possible head injury, stupor, dizziness, drowsiness, or has had a syncopal episode. Uh, with the neurological assessment, you're going to evaluate the level of consciousness and orientation to determine the patient's ability to think. So we want to use the AVPU scale and, and see if it's appropriate um, to determine the patient's mental status. The Glasgow Coma Scale, or GCS, score can be helpful in providing additional information on patients with mental status changes. Use parameters to test a patient's eye opening, the best verbal response, and best motor response. Provide a numeric score that defines the severity of the patient's brain dysfunction. The next thing we're going to use with the neurologic uh, system is the pupils. The pupil is is the back center portion of the eye. The pupil are, uh, pupils are normally round and of approximately equal size and adjust their sizes depending on the availability of light. The, di uh, the diameter and reactivity to light of the patient's pupil can reflect the status of the brain's perfusion, oxygenation, and condition. In the absence of light, the pupils will become fully relaxed and dilated. A small number of population exhibit unequal pupils. The photos on the slide show examples of constricted, dilated, and unequal pupils. A number of population exhibit unequal pupils. And you should assume the patient has altered brain function as a result of a service, central nervous system depression or injury if the pupils react in any of the following ways. So if they become fixed with no reaction to changes in light, if they dilate with introduction of bright light and constrict when the light is removed, or if they react sluggish instead of briskly, if they become unequal inside, size or if they become unequal in size when a bright light is introduced into or removed from one eye. Depressed uh, brain function can be caused by the following. Injury of the brain or brainstem, trauma or stroke, a brain tumor, inadequate oxygenation or perfusion, or drug or toxins. The pneumonic pearl 
is often used as an assessment for the pupils. So P, uh, pupils equal and round and regular in size, which are reacted to light. So assessing the neurovascular status. So perform a hands-on assessment to determine sensory and motor response. Check for bilateral muscle strength and weakness. Complete a thorough sensory assessment and test for pain, sensations, and position. And compare distal and proximal sensory and motor responses on one side and the other. So atomic regions, the head, neck, and cervical spine. Um, we're going to gently palpate the scalp and skin for any pain, deformity, tenderness, crepitus, and breathing. And we're going to check the patient's eyes, assess the, the pupillary function, size, and response, and check the color of the sclera, assess the patient's cheekbones uh, for possible injury, and check the patient's ears and nose for fluid. And next, uh, with the trauma assessment, we're going to do the, um, we're going to check the uh, upper and lower mandible or the jaw. We're going to open the patient's mouth looking for any broken or missing teeth. Note any unusual odors that may be present. And we're going to palpate the neck for signs of trauma, such as deformities, bumps, swelling, bruising, bleeding, and any cracking sounds produced by air bubbles under the skin. This is known as subcutaneous emphysema. Now we're just going to move down to perform the assessment. So we're going to move down into the chest and we're going to um, visualize, palpate, and uh, um, listen. Uh, we're going to assess the breathing. We're going to watch for both sides of chest rise and fall together with normal breathing. And we're going to absorb for abnormal breathing signs, including retractions or paradoxical motion. Then just moving down from the chest, we're going to move into the abdomen. We're looking for trauma to the abdomen or for distension. We're going to palpate the abdomen for tenderness and rigidity or guarding. The abdomen is broken into four quadrants. And uh, so the left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant, up right upper, and the right lower quadrant. We're going to assess for the presence of rebound tenderness. Then we're gonna move down into the pelvis. We're gonna inspect for symmetry and any obvious signs of, uh, of injuries. We're, if you feel any movement or crepitus or if the patient reports any pain or tenderness, um, a severe injury may be present. So then we're gonna move down to the extremities. We're gonna inspect uh, for severity um, uh, for any DCAP BTLS and we're gonna look for symmetry. We're going to palpate along each extremity for deformities and check for pulses, motor function, and sensory functions. Then we're going to do the posterior of the body. So we need to inspect the back for any decap BTLS, um, symmetry, or open wounds. We're going to carefully palpate the spine from the neck to the pelvis for tenderness and deformity. All right. And we're going to assess the vital signs. So these devices should uh, should never be used to replace uh, your assessment of your patient. You need to think of these devices as uh, just uh, adjuncts to the assessment and treatment of your patient. So the first one we're going to talk about is pulse oximetry. So pulse oximetry is an assessment tool that which we use to evaluate the eff effectiveness of oxygenation. It measures the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin in the capillary beds. Um, so a sensing probe is placed on the finger or on the earlobe. In most patients, the values will fall between 95% and 99%. Patients with difficulty breathing should receive oxygen regardless of their pulse ox value. And severe conditions can give false values. So shock, hypothermia, bleeding, anemia, and carbon monoxide exposure. Okay, the next vital sign um, tool we can use is capnography. So remember a non-invasive method, um, it can quickly and uh, efficiently provide information on the patient's ventilation, circulation, and metabolism. 
Then next, we're going to talk about blood glucose. So that uh, measures the level of, of glucose in the patient's bloodstream. And you could see how to perform that in your skill drill in chapter nine uh, in skill drill 9-6. The next couple slides, we're going to talk about uh, um, your blood pressure. And so non-invasive uh, blood pressure measurement, um, it has a sphygmometer. Um, which is a blood pressure cuff, and it's used to measure blood pressure, of course. And then there's electronic measurements is another method of me of measuring blood pressures. Um, next, we're going to talk about the reassessment. So perform a reassessment at regular intervals during your assessment process. Uh, the pro purpose of reassessment is to identify and treat any changes in the patient condition. You want to repeat your primary assessment, reassess by all vital signs, and compare those. Look for trends, reassess the mental status, and monitor skin color and temperature. You want to reassess the chief complaint, and the purpose is to ask the and answer the following questions about your patient's chief complaint. So is the current treatment improving the patient's condition? Have you, has an already identified problem gotten better or has an ide already identified problem gotten worse? Or and what is the nature of any newly identified problems? We're going to recheck interventions, so which includes um, anything with the ABCs. We're going to manage bleeding and we're going to ensure adequacy of all the interventions and consider the need for new ones. Then we're going to identify and treat changes in the patient's condition. So if the patient's condition has worsened or improved, um, we need to, uh, to treat. And if the patient's condition deteriorates, we need the proper prepare to modify our treatments as appropriate. And we're going to document any changes, whether they're negative or positive. A patient who is unstable, we're reassessing every five minutes. And a patient who is um, uh, stable is every uh, 15 minutes. So unstable is every five minutes and stable is every 15 minutes. Okay, so I know that that was a long uh, lecture, uh, but uh, thank you for joining me today for the chapter nine patient assessment lecture. And uh, the next thing that we're going to go through on the slides is the review questions, and I'll allow you to do those on your own. Thank you.